a big endorsement with very little fanfare today. If there's one thing we've learned as a country from moments of great crisis, it's that the spirit of looking out for one another can't be restricted to our homes or our workplaces or our neighborhoods or our houses of worship. It also has to be reflected in our national government. And that's why I'm so proud to endorse Joe Biden for president of the United States. The former president's announcement probably reminded many who saw it that there's still a presidential election ahead, meaning the entire nation is supposed to head to the polls not all that long from now. And while that may seem unthinkable to many in the era of social distancing, Wisconsin has proved it's not exactly out of the question. Holding an in-person primary last week, after Democrats lost a weeks-long battle to switch from all-mail balloting or to at least push the date back. In the end, the U.S. Supreme Court shot down a last-ditch effort to extend that deadline for certain mail-in ballots by a mere six days. In a five-to-four vote, the conservative majority opted not to protect the voters of Wisconsin. But of note, they are protecting themselves these days, hearing all their oral arguments in May by teleconference. As one journalist wrote in a New York Times op-ed, the Supreme Court just met its first test of the coronavirus era. It failed spectacularly. I'm joined by the woman who wrote those words, Pulitzer Prize winner and former Supreme Court reporter Linda Greenhouse. She's now a Times contributing opinion writer and lecturer at Yale Law. Yale, uh, Linda, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. You seized on one line in particular in the majority decision. This court has repeatedly emphasized that lower federal courts should ordinarily not alter the election rules on the eve of an election. Why those words and why that one word, ordinarily? Well, I, I, I read, I was kind of breathtaken when I read that, because what is ordinary about the way we're living? What's ordinary about, as you just said, the way the court is functioning? What's ordinary about having to be in fear of your life if you go to the polling place to stand in a crowded line and cast a ballot? The notion of the five-member majority, the five conservatives on the court, lecturing just as Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the other three dissenters about Oh, well, we do things in an ordinary way, don't you know? Uh, I, I, just, I just found it shocking. And, and I'm sure you saw a piece a couple of days later by George Conway, a conservative lawyer who I think most people in America is not exactly a big Trump fan, who said the court made the right decision because he, he said it was very narrow that essentially election officials there had approved the receipt of ballots as long as six days after Election Day, as long as they were postmarked by Election Day. And all the Supreme Court said was inappropriate and they wouldn't allow were ballots absolutely ballots that were postmarked after Election Day. Where is he wrong? Well, with due respect to George Conway and his co-author on that piece, my friend David Latt, mm -hmm. a very fine person who just recovered from a horrible ventilator bout That's of, a very of good the point. virus. I forgot. So with respect to both of these uh, gentlemen, they must not have read the lower court opinion the 53-page lower court opinion by a very fine federal district judge in Wisconsin, Judge Conley, who pointed out that tens of thousands of Wisconsin voters who had requested their absentee ballots on time were not going to receive them on time because, for instance, in I think it was in the city of Madison, there were 10 times the usual number of requests for absentee ballots. So the election infrastructure was just totally overwhelmed. And people who had to get their ballot postmarked by election day wouldn't even have their ballot by election day. That was the problem that the, 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 the Judge Conley was trying to fix and that the Supreme Court majority just batted out of the park. One other uh, a person who in your paper wrote about of this decision, but put it in an even bigger context, was Jamel Bowie, I'm sure you saw this, who put it in the context of other voter suppression decisions, for lack of a better expression, from the Supreme Court. Citizens United obviously allowing unlimited donations to a great degree. The, the virtual gutting of the Voting Rights Act, which I believe Justice, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, and then that basically saying we can't deal with extreme partisan gerrymandering. He thought it was a much more ominous decision than many who just focused on the decision itself. Do you share Bowie's concerns? 
Well, I do. I would put a slightly different spin on it. I mean, I, yes, the court certainly in uh, its inability to deal with gerrymandering and in the Shelby County case, which gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a shocking decision, five to four. Uh, you know, the court has been uh, inadequately attentive to the essential nature of the right to vote. But I think what's going on here, though, is not quite that, or maybe a piece of that, but just inattention to the real world, the way people are living yeah. today. And what's scary is, of course, there are more primaries coming in June. This problem is not going to be open, over by June. And, of course, the general election in November, we have no way of knowing sitting here in the comfort of my home and in your studio, what life is going to be like in November. And there's no indication that the Supreme Court is going to be willing to help instead of hinder. You know, one of the things I thought of when I read your piece was the comment that that uh, the president made, I don't know, maybe last year where he uh, drew a rebuke from the a rare one from the chief justice when uh, President Trump said something like, there are Obama judges and there are Trump judges. And lawyers around the country ran to circle uh, in support around Justice Chief Justice Roberts when he said, that's not true. But Trump's right about that, isn't he, Linda? There are Obama judges and there are Trump judges. This is a court divided by partisan politics, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to be super reductive about it, but certainly it's really hard. And people who read my, my columns know how hard I work to try not to. I know that. Just write them all off, you know. Uh, but it was just, I think in my column, I used the word disheartening. When I first read the opinion, first I just felt, you know, a little bit sick. Then I got mad. But the sick came from just being so sorry that, it's going to be so hard to look at the court as anything other than this politically divided body that we saw on display there. By the way, this coming from a woman who has covered Supreme Court for a mere, what, 40 years? Is that how long you covered the court? Um, yeah, yeah, 40 Can and I, counting. While I have you, I don't often have Linda Greenhouse to run constitutional issues by. So in the remaining minute or two, uh, another issue that may end up uh, reaching the Supreme Court was raised by the president of the United States yesterday. It is coronavirus uh, White House task force briefing. Here is President Trump. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. It's total. The authority is total. It's total. It's total. And the governors know that. This was about, of course, his, his ability, his unilateral ability to open uh, the economy, to open America, as he put it. And while we were waiting, he said to uh, the reporter from CNN, they're writing up papers. While we're waiting for those papers, does he have a constitutional leg to stand on here, Linda? No, no. But what he's got is an attorney general at his side doesn't usually show his face, but at a side who believes that, you know, the president is the total executive. So uh, that's what we've got. Uh, Mike Pence was asked, a reporter said, can I ask the vice president if he agrees with you? And Mike Pence said it, cited the national emergency declarations intimating that they give the president powers that he, I was about to say, or she, that he would otherwise not have was Pence on the mark, or was he off base too? Well, there's a difference between having, you know, some powers with an emergency declaration and having all powers. So the president is claiming all powers, whereas I think just a couple of weeks ago he said, it's not my responsibility, it's your problem. Mm. So, you know, that's what we've got. So before you go quickly, I've always wanted cameras in the courtroom. I know we're not getting that, but we're about to get live audio from the Supreme Court in May, are you celebrating? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll celebrate when I hear what it is that they actually do with those cases. Much better answer than my question. Linda Greenhouse, it's great to meet you, and thanks for your fabulous work through the years. Thank you. Appreciate it. Linda Greenhouse.